Hello and welcome back to As For Me In My House. I'm Jordan. And I'm Elena. Ooh, sorry. I'm Elena. <laughs> my <laughs> mic was way out there. And we are bringing you guys another Q&A. It's been a hot minute. Yes. I don't even know if we've done one this year. Really? Yes, we have. Maybe like earlier in the year. Like we totally time. have. Q&As I feel like are fun because we're able to answer just a mosh posh of things that I feel like we frequently get. Mosh posh? I always say it wrong. What is it? Hodgepodge. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, we can go with Mosh Podge. I like that better. That's going to be like the new, like anytime there's a Q&A, it's just going to be Mosh Podge. Yes, perfect. But at any rate, yeah, we asked you guys some questions that you had for us mm-hmm. and we're just going to jump right in. All right. First thing that we got the number one most asked question about is Halloween. And we actually just did an episode the previous week that we will link down below that we extensively talk about where we came from where we are at what our convictions are with that and an encouragement to anyone who has been feeling convicted about it and just doesn't know how to go about it we talk quite a lot about it and elaborate in a very hopefully gentle way Mm -hmm. um and so we will link that down below for you guys next question honey is this one do you like my new style of course (laughs) i think i feel like i've answered that before But yeah, there's something, I mean, just to elaborate a little bit on it, there's something about you dressing more elegant, classy, that makes me admire your role as a mother Mm -hmm. and a wife now, where, I don't know, it'd be kind of weird if you dressed like you still did when you were in high school, Right. and I'm 28 now, and I'm like, yeah, that's, I don't know, that just has like a weird feeling to me, so yeah. You're kind of like Especially going through. Especially because we've been dating since I was 15. Yeah. For me to have been dressing the same way that I have since I was 15 at 26. Like when a 45-year-old soccer mom dresses like her son's friends that are girls in high school. Like that's weird. Mm. You know, like there's, yeah. you shouldn't you dress like your kids. I mean, we talked about, I feel like we've talked about outfit stuff before. Where like. I don't think we have. Are you sure? Because I feel like we've talked, maybe it was on your main channel, but. There's something about, you know, you could still dress like classy and stylish, but also like, I don't know, your age, if that makes sense. Tasteful. Yeah. I mean, if you're 26 now, so you're still young, but you're not like a teenager. You right. know, you have a sense of refined, you know, style now. And I like it. I think it's great. I'm not forcing Melena, obviously. Um, that's her choice and her decisions of how she, you know, how she wants to approach modesty and Mm -hmm. like how do I want to represent myself to Alethea and Ari and Evangeline and both from a woman and a man perspective right and Mm so that's that's I think that's awesome I think I'll ask you this do you feel more respected in the way that I dress oh yeah yeah not that I felt disrespected before but I feel now there's like the sense of oh nobody's there's everything's left to imagination you know Mm -hmm. like there's but you're also still very cute and Mm -hmm fashionable I, I don't know classy like there, mm-hmm. there's just a you get to unwrap the gift box <laughs> yeah i do <laughs> so that's always fun but yeah as far as the actual style yeah i'm here for it i like it thanks fun yeah i feel like that's a question that i've actually gotten a lot recently um all right what was the most difficult season in your marriage and how did you overcome this i wanted to see what your answer was because i didn't know if ours would be similar hmm I mean, as far as the most difficult, I don't know. It's all kind of difficult. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. If uh, if I had to say, probably right when we started out. Yeah. I think when we first got married and we're like, what is this? What does it mean to be husband and wife? Mm-hmm. What's our day-to-day look like? What's our, like... What does it mean to be an adult? Again, you have to remember we were 20. I was 20. Jordan was 22. This is our first time living outside of our parents' homes. So not only did we have to figure out how to be married, but then we also had to figure out how to be adults. And like it was a lot at once. Which is actually an interesting phenomenon. Our like the the um, Gen Z and the millennial generation, like this word adulting that didn't exist before. And it was just like life right like so the fact that you you have like 35 year olds saying oh i have to go adulting now like that's just that's weird like that's not normal Uh. and i don't think that's a good thing that we're kind of attaching like normal life skills and life obligations and life things to say like 
and I'm guilty of that too, right? Like I would say, oh, I'm, I'm adulting or like, but then I started thinking like, that's weird. Why am I saying that? You know? Yeah. So I, th- I say all that to say, um, we were trying to figure that out at 20 and 22. And it's like, there were guys going off to war in World War II that were 18, some of them younger, faking their, their mm-hmm. birth certificate because they're like going off <laughs> to won. fight in war. And now it's like, okay, I'm 18 and I don't feel safe if I don't have, you know, yellow walls in my college lecture hall because any other color makes me unsafe. It's like, what is that? Right. Like, so we've, we've definitely as a society, I I think trended (laughs) away from maturity and away from like this idea of taking on responsibility. But I know for us, when we first started, I was so selfish. I was too. I mean, we were, we were living, we were basically like roommates with benefits, you know, like Mm -hmm. we weren't, we were in a covenant relationship, but we weren't acting like it or living like it. So yeah. that caused a lot of like headbutting, a lot of friction, a lot of like, You're okay, just immature. Ill-prepared. Like I would just want to go off to the gym and work out and like just be by myself. And Milena would like, well, why don't you want to be with me? And what's wrong with me? And like, do you not love me? You know? And mm-hmm. so we had all these like emotional things. It sounds kind of petty now, but yeah, I was very like emotionally driven. Just it was like- petty. <laughs> Yeah, very selfish, immature, lacking faith, lacking biblical discipline, lacking even knowing what a biblical life meant. Um, lukewarm, not saturated by the right friendships or like fellowship at all. I had no one to mentor me, no Titus to like. Mm-hmm. We could hold. We could do a whole podcast about that. I mean, you guys could probably even like pick up on that from seeing even. As for me, my house from when we first started till today. Right. Not to say like we've arrived now because we're going to be. I saw this meme. It was like, just remember the future you is cringing at the current you. That is the truest <laughs> statement I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, that's, but that's with the advent of the internet and, you know, yeah. the internet's forever and stuff. People have like receipts and can go finding, like digging de- back and stuff. And it's mm-hmm. like, okay, well, yeah. So, you mean to tell me that you don't ever change or grow or mature or right. develop or in your walk with the Lord? Like, no, we're all works in progress. So mm-hmm. we can't pass judgment on somebody else if they're like, I'm still figuring this out versus, oh, yeah, I, I figured that out 10 years ago. Now I'm mm-hmm. struggling with something here because right. everything's a sliding scale. So yeah. for yeah. us in our marriage, I would say starting off was definitely mm-hmm. a time of like really finding our footing. And yeah, it was it was hard to navigate that dynamic but by god's grace it it worked out and and i'd say the this Lord, year has the been took us through it it's been like our favorite year of marriage so far oh yeah all right honey how is the house coming along we got lots of questions about that the house mm. is coming along great building a house is a long process yeah um and it's a lot of meetings lots of meetings lots of decisions to say that i am decision fatigued would be an understatement the, yeah the understatement of the year yeah, but it's coming along. We're so excited. Um, it's hard adulting. <laughs> and it's definitely been slightly different than when we did a semi-custom house, which was our previous house, um, versus this one, because every outlet, every switch, everything we have to like say yes to. And so again, the decision fatigue, I'm like, I didn't even know that you could put a light switch there or like like just a lot of those types of things and so it's been exciting and it's been great and so yeah, yeah it's we're not complaining along. by any means it's just there's so much that goes into it, it really has if nothing else has made us appreciate the process und- yes we definitely how much our builder and his team and the subcontractors like how much they do at right. at that scale and that volume it's just it's incredible so yeah very thankful um yeah we're, we're excited to be I moving just, in i didn't know that i'd have to tell them where to put light switches like there's mm. just been so many little things that i was like i didn't Okay, I yeah, guess they it walk can go like there. okay. You got 182 plugs uh, on your budget, so <laughs> let's go around and walk the entire house and figure out exactly which where <laughs> square inch you want this. You know, yeah, but it's all fun things. Yeah, so it's good. It's going well. Thanks for asking. Do you worry that homeschool will affect your kids' social skills? Oh, I was actually thinking of this on the car ride home. I have some thoughts here because actually, a guy I used to work with. Um, was like super bought into like public school, public everything. And one of the big kind of indictments against homeschool is, why well, aren't your kids going to be like unsocialized? Mm-hmm. And I kind of laughed at first because I thought, 
wow, how, how the world has changed in just a few short years when it comes to what does it mean to socialize, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you have, when you say, you know, put kids in a, kids in, I think Tim Hawkins, actually a Christian comedian, he's actually pretty funny. Um, he talks about how homeschool kids, like they get, they're allowed to talk and socialize, but if you go to a public school, you get put in timeout or go out in the hallway for talking and socializing. So it's like, you know, there's a, there's certainly a program and I, I understand things have to be like, you know, you have a, a certain cadence and you can't let it be a free for all with 30, 40 kids, you know, mm -hmm. however many are, are in schools these days. But, mm -hmm. um, there's something about, uh, well, there's two dynamics to it. One, no, I'm not worried about them not being socialized because we have so many extracurriculars. If you guys know our kids, our kids are the most social kids. So yeah. we can't get our kids to stop. I mean, whether we're out in public, whether they're at a um, like a homeschool community gathering, whether we're at church, whether we're at, uh, you know. Play dates. What, whatever that might look can, like. You definitely can. Because I, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people say like they were homeschooled and they did nothing but stay at home all day. And so they did not have social rac social interaction. And while, yes, that may be true for some people, that is not what we're doing. When we homeschool, we're not isolating. We're not at home all day. We are very, I the idea of leaving the house and not just being at home all day is something that I feel like I'm very aware of. And so we are constantly trying to socialize the kids. They are involved in several homeschool, different communities. Um, church activities, play dates, they are very socialized. And I would say that the idea of a homeschool child not being socialized, I would beg the question to say that a child that goes to public school isn't socialized because they're limited to the same 30 kids in the same age day in and day out. And so I feel like our kids have the opportunity to socialize with a range of kids in different age groups too. Um, and so I think you could ask this question for both. I think both have the ability to have pros and cons. And so I think mm -hmm. we're just aware that that might be like a um, a con to homeschooling, and but it's a very fixable problem. It's very just a, easy solution. It's a challenge like anything else. Like, like there's challenges in public school. It's just a different one. Yeah. And one other huge factor of all of this that people aren't really talking about is the difference of peer centered versus uh multiple generation centered if you will um childhood upbringings and what i mean by it is there's a, a book one of my favorite books that i've ever read is called father's compass by jeremy Pryor. and in chapter four of the this book he's basically giving insights on fatherhood and what it means to raise children biblically and he talks about the predictable trap of a peer centered childhood and I just want to read, I think it's important as we're on this question, because I just want to take a couple minutes and read some of the data and the research that's coming out around all of this and what what's the challenges, what are the, some of the considerations and the caution that we need to take as we're raising kids in this day and age. Mm -hmm. So he says this, there's so many ways kids today are growing up in environments never before attempted or in many cases even imagined. One of these social experiments we've been running both in the church and at school is to raise and educate kids almost entirely in same age groups. Now let's pause there for a second. You might think to yourself, well, yeah, obviously, like that's the, that's the thing. It's been so ingrained and so drilled into our head and we, like, we never questioned it, right? Mm -hmm. Like last week's episode we did on Halloween, like, well, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you celebrate? Like that's so weird to people. Like we never, so, so half of the battle with all of these things that we're talking about it's not just us trying to be like all countercultural and be an edge lord and be like, oh, look at us, we're so different. Like, it's more just questioning things that we've just always assumed or always taken as fact de facto reality. It's like, well, mm -hmm. wait, why are we celebrating Halloween? Wait, why are we putting kids in all entirely piercing? Like, you know, so part of it is just asking the right questions, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can start forming the why behind behind why you do what you do. And so that's all that that's all that's being brought up here. And so. It's clear, Jeremy continues, it's clear the advantages to the system for both control and for curriculum. The transition from the one-room schoolhouse to same-age classes emerged from the need to educate children at a massive industrial scale. Mm. This in turn has given rise to a new kind of person, the peer-centered child. Mm. We now tend to take it for granted that a child will care less about their parents' opinions of them and more about their peers. We assume, because this is so common, this is healthy socialization. But is it? 
After spending decades looking at the data, two secular Canadian doctors are now claiming this development is extremely unhealthy and even dangerous. In their groundbreaking book, Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers, they lay out this thesis, quote, children today look to their peers for direction, their values, identity, and codes of behavior. This peer orientation undermines family cohesion, interferes with healthy development, and fosters a hostile and sexualized youth culture. Children end up becoming overly conformist, desensitized, and alienated, and being cool matters more to them than anything else, end quote. Mm -hmm. So here's the prescription that these two secular Canadian doctors give. Increase parental influence and reestablish proper hierarchy in the home in order to make our kids feel safe and understood and earn back their loyalty and love. And then he elaborates some more, but basically the bottom line is our entire society, this is the, the ending of that chapter, our entire society is designed around breaking up the children of the family into these same age groups from sports to schools and even to church programs. Creating alternatives to counter this pattern is challenging and costly to the family, but perhaps not as challenging or costly in the long term as losing the hearts of our kids. So wow, I couldn't agree more with that. And so when it comes yeah, to homeschooling, yes, you have to have some challenges and there's some things you have to do to think outside the box and be creative. But no, I'm not worried about our kids not being socialized. If anything, they're going to know how to talk to both adults, to older children, to younger children, to grandparents, to across, you know, high and wide to a multiple, di a plethora of, of people and age groups and feel comfortable in all of them. So we're not just continuing in the same patterns that we see in, in the definition of insanity of doing the same thing, but expecting different results, right? Like you have to kick mm -hmm. against the prick and you have to go against the grade and swim upstream sometimes. Mm -hmm. And this is just one of those ways that we're, we're choosing to do that. But we could do a whole episode on that. I feel like I almost just we did a whole episode. Could, yeah, no, that. honestly, we could but. because, again, we have just learned so much this last year. I feel like I've never learned as much as I have. Yeah, last and shameless plug life. if you're uh, not uh, aware of Jeremy Pryor, Jeff Bethke, family mm -hmm. teams, um, their books, family revision. They're some of the greatest resources really you could find Jeremy on. I really want to have Jeremy on the podcast. Yeah, I'd love to do that. For like 20 episodes. <laughs> yeah, we could do the biblical feast. <laughs> he can just run the podcast yeah because he's just so great we've won yeah jeremy do you want to just come on here and we'll hand it hand everything off yeah but yeah i'll have to say if you're looking for some resources on like how do i think biblically about training and leading my children and being a a coach on a team with my family and how do i raise them up to know the lord in a way that yes is countercultural but also biblical and, and beneficial for the long game they're they're top of the list as far as resources so definitely yeah. check them out mm -hmm. we could even link that let's let's link their stuff down below we can put put a link to family teams and yeah. uh, their podcasts and all that stuff all right this next question is is it ever too late to become a christian i <laughs> have found such comfort and peace in following you just ask the thief, thief on the cross this is this question just absolutely makes my day because I have had such a pivotal turn in why I create content and I was just so tired of having and being identified as like the cute family blogger, like the cute, they have a cute family and like they're cute. Like I just, that was just so nauseating to me. I wanted to be known as the girl who encouraged a wife to become a better wife. I wanted to be the girl that encouraged families to stay together. I wanted to be the one that pointed people to Jesus. And, and that there was just for just personal a, benef no, betterment. Like it's it's for, all for the glory of God. Right, right. And so the fact that you say that you have found comfort and peace following me means that you have found peace and comfort in knowing the Lord or having a glimpse of what he can do in your life. And so, no, it is never too late to become a Christian. There's no such thing. Mm. Um, we talk about this in our episode about the ha Halloween, but there's no one that's unredeemable. There's no one that's un too far gone. Like that is just a complete lie from the enemy. If anything, if you look at the scripture, if you look at who God has used, he literally took Saul who was murdering Christians, killing them, hated them, wi like wife, kids, everything, the most evil person. He used him to write pretty much a lot of the New Testament. And evangelized to the entire Greek or Gentile world. Yes. He, he was the apostle to the Gentile world. Mm -hmm. And so imagine where, we, where would we be if it weren't for Paul? Every one of us who's not Jewish can link our, our salvation back to the work of Paul mm -hmm. at one point in history, which is pretty it's phenomenal crazy. when you think about it. So yeah. 
no, it's never too late. I mentioned the thief on the cross. If you're new to Christianity, I mm -hmm. strongly encourage you to get a Bible or you send us an email as for me in my house podcast at gmail.com. We'd love to get, gift you a Bible. And uh, what's her name? Rebecca. I just wanted to mention it personally because um, not her whole name, but just her, <laughs> her, her first name, because this is yeah. super important. So Rebecca, if you're watching this, we're so glad you're here. We're so thankful and, and uh, excited for you. And the thief on the cross that Jesus was crucified with two uh, criminals on either side of him. And he was the one who was innocent uh, in the place of us who deserved to be on that, at, on that cross meta and the meta narrative. Right. And so the one thief is mocking him and telling him, you know, why don't you just get off the cross if you're truly God, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't like he, he completely didn't understand what was going on. Yeah. Then the other thief says, "You don't understand. This man did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. You and me, we deserve this, mm -hmm. but he did nothing wrong." And mm -hmm. then he looks at Jesus and says, "Lord, remember me when you enter into king, into your kingdom." And he says to the thief, "Surely on this day you will be with me in paradise." And this guy was ninety nine point nine 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 percent of his life. Uh, a, far from God, didn't know God, didn't didn't know Jesus, didn't have peace, lived the life of crime, and now he's finally paying the just deserve of what he he has, you know, or what he's what he's deserving, he's getting, and he says, "Remember me," and basically confessing, saying, "I need to be saved. Will you save me?" And what what's funny about that is, I often think, "Oh wow, he didn't have much time to." Uh, you know, live for Jesus or do good works or do good deeds. But one of the, one of the, uh, one of the pictures I, I could totally see happening in heaven is this thief getting to the throne, standing before God almighty and saying, Lord, I don't have any, I don't have any works to show. I don't have any good deeds that I, I did. And I could almost see uh, God putting his hands on <laughs> this thief's shoulders and pointing behind and spinning him around and saying, look at this line for miles long of people lined up. They're here because they heard your story. Mm -hmm. They heard your testimony that it wasn't too late to become a Christian. It wasn't too late to be saved. That if you have breath in your lungs, there's still hope of redemption. And so I think that thief's impact in his story is going to mean more than he realizes and that we realize. So we're glad you're here. Thank you. And, uh, let us know. We'd love to get you a Bible and help you kind of get started on your on your faith journey. <laughs> oh, poor honey. <laughs> I love that story. Oh, do we have tissue? <laughs> yeah, let me get you. Moving on to a spicy one. <laughs> <laughs> that was apparently spicy. <laughs> your eyes are watering. <laughs> How do you deal with in-laws? Have you ever had problems with in-laws not respecting boundaries? Just completely kiddos, remove yourself. Cetera's. Just go move to the other side of the country. Or the other side of the world, actually, better yet. And never no, have any interaction. No, because you'll still have problems then. I'll tell you that. Um, yes, it's inescapable. This, it, it really is. And I think... In a good way, though. This is such a multifaceted question because there's so many different things to talk about. One... The unity that is formed between between you and your spouse. You two are making a covenant together between you two. That includes no one else. And so I think most of the time when a boundary is overstepped, it is because this is put into question. You're becoming your own family yes. with your with yes. your new spouse. Yes. And so But you don't stop being a son or a daughter either. Right. So that's but, the, that's the tension. And then the other thing is that as parents, once you guys are parents. You are the ones accountable and responsible for how you steward the gift of having children. And so that's a whole nother element, especially once you start breaking and questioning how things were done. If you start doing things that once were like this year, as we guys, as we've mentioned in Halloween, um, one of the things that we are thinking about is Christmas and whether or not we want to celebrate that. And I, I know that even bringing that up, there's going to be tension or there will be question. I remember when we first Or what does it up, look like to celebrate that? Is it always right. going to look like it's looked the last 26 years. years, 25, mm -hmm. 24 years, right? Right. Or are there going to be some major changes? Or are there just going to be some smaller changes, but it's enough to make a shift in the whole mm -hmm. experience, right? Right. One th verse that I actually did want to mention is in Proverbs. While you're turning to that, I, I found it. Okay, go ahead. 
Okay, grandparents are the crown of the aged and the glory of children is their fathers. So this is one of the only few places that grandparents and grandchildren actually get mar- uh, mentioned. But this is something that we need to think about is that grandchildren are the crown of your parents. And so to use or... Again, there's so much you could say here, but I think manipulation is something that's used a lot. I think um, for just own selfish reasons and control reasons, there's there's a lot of reasons why people run into in-law problems um, and overstepping boundaries, I think, is one of them. But I think that as parents, we also need to realize that the Bible literally says that grandchildren are a crown. And so to say that mm-hmm. you might be in unallowing or stopping or preventing your children to having a relationship Using with their them grandparents as, as as ammunition against yes right? yeah you are taking away the ability for your grandparents to have these crowns that proverbs talks about and so it's proverbs 17 6 so i think with everything you need to be prayerful with everything you need to be cautious like mm-hmm. there's I don't really know how to answer this because everyone at some point will run into this and we actually would love to have an episode with Dave and Ashley. I was just going to mention them. Yeah. So Dave and Ashley Willis, they're friends of ours. Um, They have, they have a lot of great uh, resources and advice when it comes to like sex and marriage, but they just came out with a book called married into the family. And it's all Mm -hmm. about uh, another shameless plug. It's all about, uh, navigating those in-law relationships yep. and we would love to have them on in the yeah. future uh, so let us know below if that's you and you're like yeah, yeah i need to figure they, out how do i navigate this they've because... redeemed a whole relationship which is <laughs> yeah. i think so beautiful because again oftentimes multi-generational families is biblical mm-hmm. like that is something that is straight up biblical and our world is so removed from that i think it's so normalized to have cain and abel sibling situations where like so and so doesn't talk to so and so hasn't talked to so and so in 20 years or you have brother wars like jacob and esau yeah like then they're reconciled in the end right right and just 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 estranged families and that's not biblical and so it's not normal Sure, you will have tension and there will be issues of having to reestablish boundaries. But to sit there and say, like, I just can't have a relationship with X, Y and Z isn't biblical. Well, I have to preface that because I think sexual abuse and physical abuse, like those are reasons for that. Um, But just to say, like, I'm not talking to X, Y and Z because they didn't like my yellow dress last week is not. So, yeah, well, we should end it there because I feel like we could talk about this for so long. No, that's fine. All right. Should a woman wait until the husband is fully able to provide 100% before engagement? It's a good question. I think this is too specific of a question for us to answer because there's a lot of variables in everything like this. The, uh, it sounds like a dodge, but it really isn't. But I would say it, it depends, right? Like mm-hmm. in my family's experience, like with my parents, my mother was in, uh, she was getting her master's in education and my dad was getting his JD to be a, a prosecuting attorney. And for a while, like they were, they're the only ones in their family to go to college. They're both the youngest in their families. And they saw like in that, in that era, like the value of college and how like getting a, a university degree was so uh, important to the career paths that they chose to, to, to lead. And so, there was a time for, I want to say two, maybe three years when my, maybe it was, yeah, about two, two, three years where my mom was working as a uh, high school uh, English teacher and my dad was still in school. So he wasn't earning income, but they were, uh, they were married at this point and they were just like, how do we navigate this? And so for a season, knowing that, okay, the trajectory is like, my dad wasn't just like sitting on the couch, right? Like he was in school, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't the one earning the income. Mm -hmm. And so my mom felt like, yeah, I'm going to do this because it's an investment into our relationship and her working for a couple years and earning being the bread, the breadwinner, right? Mm -hmm. Paid off because when my dad graduated and then he started working and then, you know, things progressed. Now you have uh, you know, this reorganization or re- reworking of things. So mm-hmm. I think it's just season dependent. It's 
case dependent, right? right. It's situation dependent. Search, search scripture. So yeah, I would I would say you don't have to necessarily be hard and fast on it, but weigh all the options out in, in your plan and in your current situation mm-hmm. and say, all right, what does it mean to look 100% providing? Or if we're not there now, why aren't we? And what are we working towards? I think are those are the questions you need to start asking to begin your answer at least. Mm-hmm. Next question is biggest tip for married couples who are in the stage of trying to have a baby. Mm. Um, I would actually love to encourage you instead of saying the biggest thing that we learned with our miscarriage is how little control we have of things and how we don't have the ability or we have an illusion of what we think is reality. We have an illusion of what we think we have control over. There's Mm -hmm. just an illusion of the idea of like building a perfect family or when is the right time or we're in a season of waiting. It's like, who said you were, what are you waiting? Who said We're going to have a boy first and then a girl. Right. And we're, (laughs) we're going to stop at this point. And our boy's going to have blonde hair and our daughter's going to have dark skin and dark hair. It's like, how, how foolish do we think to, to be in control of all these things that we're not? Yes. So I would use this season as an opportunity to grow as a couple, um, caution you very lightly to not I use a child as a way of idolatry because that is a very slippery slope that people end up in without even realizing you can it. You can children. idol yeah. or the idea of the child or the idea of trying that can mm-hmm. easily become an idol. An idol is anything that you think about more than God, desire more than God, want more than God. And so if mm-hmm. though if that is able to replace God, then that has become an idol. And so I would just be very cautious in this season. Um, there's so much growth that can happen in that area. And I think a lot of people use it in vain. And so Mm -hmm. use this waiting season as an opportunity to strengthen your relationship. Use it as an opportunity to spread the gospel more Um, and just use it as a season for the Lord to really just prune you um, and season you and just get you ready for the season you're about to walk in um, and just surrender it to the Lord, like fully surrender your womb to the Lord. Because until you do that, it's just going to feel like, oh, the Lord's letting me down. And it's like, no, you just are placing yourself in a position that you aren't in place of. And so, um, yeah, I would like reword the word, the word trying and reword, um, dismantle the way that we even approach that like oh we started trying like we are guilty of that like we've even said that and it's like what do we think we we know people have vasectomies and end up pregnant still like there's very little yeah we know you didn't mean it that way in the question but we wanted to use it as an example for other people who might think like we think is like oh we're you know in control of when we're gonna have kids and the reality Mm -hmm. is we're not as a husband i would say to your husband uh, to encourage him i would say seek ways that you can on a, on a very practical level seek ways that you can start caring for your wife's emotional and physical well-being mm. because her body's already going to be going under a lot of changes mm-hmm. especially once she gets pregnant and mm-hmm. post delivery and mm-hmm. all the newness of like once you have a, a newborn you're like okay what what's what's going on you're like get jeremy's book uh, <laughs> father's compass and yes yeah, start uh, look at seek ways that you can care for your wife yeah, and it would be so wise to to look into hanging out with moms already, getting accustomed to being around babies, having the conversations, the hard conversations of how you want to let your raise husband your hold children. a baby if you have any uh, friends or family brave, yeah, let brave him enough change to change a baby's diaper. Like use this <laughs> yeah, season seriously. as an opportunity to grow. Mm-hmm. All right, last question, and this is going to be a spicy one. What are y'all's thoughts on sex toys within a godly marriage together and only to enhance, of course. I feel like that's a question for Dave and Ashley. <laughs> well, I actually, Dave and Ashley have actually talked about this. I'll link their episode and I actually have a different conviction than they do. Um, from what I've heard, they think it's okay to use a sex toy. So long as both are like in agreement or yes. both are okay with it. Kind yes. Of and I disagree with that. I think the idea of bringing in another object is similar to bringing in another person because the you have to ask yourself, what is sex intended for? Sex is for the you, like you two coming together, you two uniting. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that one has to be more pleased 
over the other one or one has they both have to be pleased is just not biblical it says in first corinthians that my body belongs to jordan and jordan's bodies belong to mine but nowhere does it say that we are supposed to do x y and z when this unity happens and so i think bringing in another object disrupts the unity because now we have this third thing here and so whatever that third thing is and so i would just question and ask yourself like when this object is presented are you feeling closer to your husband or are you feeling closer to the object or like and i i get people might argue like well when i am able to do this then i feel closer to my husband and i I think there's more creativity that could be done. I think there's maybe more communication that needs to happen within the bedroom to express and to be able to have your partner please you in the way that this object might. Um, and so again, it's a very vulnerable conversation to have, but I think the way that the world is treading, this is becoming more and more common. And now there's like AI stuff and there's this, I think it's just one of the very slippery slopes. And so I would just be prayerful about everything, especially this, like pray about your sex life. I know that sounds weird, but like literally pray about your sex life. Like, I feel like we could do a whole talk about this always. There's so much to dissect in this um, and not enough people talk about it, which is why I think Dave and Ashley are so popular because they're willing to talk about these things. And they have a very healthy approach <laughs> and a very biblical worldview. Yeah. And they're addressing a lot of things that aren't explicitly addressed. addressed in the bible like it doesn't say yeah. thou shall not use sex toys it just right. says like like you said your body belongs to me my body belongs to you mm -hmm. i would say pre present your body in such a way to your spouse that like that they that pleases them too right, right. And, i mean this is probably going to sound really vain or superficial but like obviously your spouse was attracted to you uh, in more ways than just one. And mm -hmm. so if you play to that in <clears throat> how you're, how you're, because we're talking about sexual intercourse, right? We're talking right. about sex between a husband and a wife. So if you're presenting yourself in a way that is appealing and attractive to your spouse, then I know it's not quite the question, but we, since we're kind of talking about hot takes mm -hmm. here, like, yeah, if, if you're, if you're into, you know, more curves, then like, your wife should be like your standard of beauty right like that's that's my wife i'm attracted to this mm -hmm. and melana is my body my body type right like she's my type you know mm -hmm. so all the things about melana like i'm highlighting and complimenting those things about her and same thing her to me and so uh, i i feel like i'm walking a tightrope because i'm like you the things that like Melana will compliment me on things and I'll compliment her on things. And that when I, when I hear that or when I feel that I'm like, we don't need anything else. Like mm. she just, right. she just needs my body and I just need her body. <laughs> if I could put it that way. You That's know? literally what first, Cor first Corinthians says. Like, yeah. So that again, you just seek scripture and see what God's word has says about scripture. Cause songs of Solomon is all about loving and some holy sex. <laughs> okay. It's not to say that if you're, you can have amazing, great and joyful, beautiful sex without having to bring something else in or someone else in. Yeah. And so um, and pray about it too. Seriously. You could be like, Lord, help me to, uh, you know, see my spouse in a way that's you know sexually and romantically mm -hmm. uh, appealing without the need to bring in any external th if you're feeling mm -hmm. really convicted by that yeah. and so we, uh, we've we have some really good uh resources like david ashley's one but if you go to exo marriage as well um like one of their conferences or just look on their website and get some resources mm -hmm. there's a lot of good stuff speaking specifically to sex and yeah. if you want like more opinions and more ideas on it. Mm -hmm. but. I just think of it like this. If Jordan came to me and said, hey, babe, you know, you're not really doing it for me. I'm going to need to bring in this other object to fully feel satisfied. As a wife, I would feel... Can't relate. I would not appreciate that. I wouldn't feel loved. I wouldn't feel valued. And so I can only imagine if I approached Jordan was like, hey, babe, you know, I want to bring in this other object in to make things complete. I can guarantee that Jordan would feel disrespected, emasculated and not good about himself. And so, again, you have to ask these questions. I don't think, again, it why, goes back why, to, it just, it goes just back to what pry you said things earlier. out. Like, is it is the goal to, for like self pleasure or right. is it for you to experience unity in a profoundly in 
intimate way with your spouse. Right. Like what's the goal there? You yeah. Know? Yeah. So ask yourself that question and mm -hmm. you should find your answer. Uh, that was a Is that it? One. Yeah. That was a good <laughs> spicy note to end on. I'm hot now. <laughs> <laughs> anyways I'm sweating. well we love you guys um let us know down below your thoughts in the comments and if there's other questions we'd love to try to answer what we can in the comments um or questions that develop off of these questions uh let us know we'll we'll engage with you guys down there bye guys <laughs>